Hello, I'm Linda Green and I'm the author of The Last Thing She Told Me. I was delighted when this novel was selected for the New Writing North's Read Regional 2020 programme. Unfortunately, as with many literary events and festivals this year, things have had to be postponed for now, but I'm looking forward to getting back to libraries later on, hopefully this year, and to meeting many of you and talking to you about this book. In the meantime, I wanted to have a little bit of a chat to you now uh, as a way of just saying hello and helping to hopefully pass some of that time while we're all self-isolating or in lockdown. So the last thing she told me is a book which basically tells the story of four generations of women from the same family. And it looks very much at the idea of the, the shame that those women have been made to feel over the years for various different things. And it's centered around Betty, who is the great grandmother of the family. And the novel starts just as Betty is on her deathbed and she's with her granddaughter, Nicola, and tells her a secret before she dies. And that secret really propels the action forward from that point because Nicola has to decide what to do with it. And it's only half of a secret. And Nicola has to decide how much she does um, want to find the answer to the, uh, the questions that's left her with and whether perhaps in doing so that will put a huge strain on the other members of her family. So the book is set in the Calder Valley in West Yorkshire, which is a place which I know and love very well and where all but my first novel have been set. And particularly it's set in the village of Peckitwell. That's where uh, Betty lives at the start of the story. And when I was thinking of a location for this novel, I wanted to try and find somewhere where I felt that perhaps a secret would have been easier to keep over many years. And I often drive down on the road from the top of the moors through Peckitwell into Hebden Bridge. And it really is sort of a, the last place um, before the moors. And I actually identified a house, the first house as you come into Peckitwell, which in my head was, was Betty's house and where I felt her story and her secret would have been kept for all those years. It is a book, as I said, very much about shame and the book is actually dedicated to women and girls who have felt shame, uh, have been made to feel shame in, by society. And it was something I was particularly interested in exploring. The actual inspiration for the, the story came sadly when my own grandmother died, age 92, a few years ago. And she just revealed before she died, again, part of something which she'd obviously kept to herself for all those years. Again, it was not a, a, a complete um, piece of a puzzle. It was just a fragment which she gave us before she passed away and left us wondering what had actually happened and what was the real story behind that. And I think that made me think about so many women of that generation who had been forced to keep things to themselves because it was a time when people didn't talk about difficult times, um, loss, personal situations, and where particularly having a baby out of wedlock or losing a baby, anything like that was considered things that were a taboo. And an awful lot of secrets were swept under the carpet. An awful lot of girls were made to um, give babies away. And uh, I wanted to look at what, how tough it must have been for those, for those women and the fact that there are so many women that have perhaps taken part or, or complete secrets to their graves. When I started thinking about the novel, I was very clear that I wanted to look at, say, several generations of one family. And what I soon started realising was that actually, although perhaps having a baby out of wedlock is no longer seen as a, the social taboo that it was then, that that's simply been replaced by all sorts of other issues which women have been shamed for over the years. And as I was writing this novel, the Me Too movement was continuing at pace around the world and we saw victims of rape being shamed, we saw women who had suffered sexual abuse and harassment in the workplace being shamed, and it made me even more determined than ever that I wanted to tell their stories as well. I think the book is important on, uh, for a lot of reasons to me, I say particularly for shining a light hopefully on some of these cases and in some of the responses I've had from readers so far where I've heard from women 
who have told me their secrets and have really um, made me think that I was right to want to, to say, you know, what an extraordinary thing it is to have to carry those secrets around with you for so many years. Um, what an awful burden it's placed on so many women. I'd just like to read uh, an extract, the prologue at the beginning of the book, which I hope will give you, again, a, a more of a sense of what it's about. It was a shame, you see, the shame I brought on my family. Sometimes it is easier to believe than to accept something so awful could have happened. That is why people bury things far beneath the surface, deep down, out of sight and out of mind though not out of my mind. I carry the shame with me always, the shame and the guilt. They do not go away. If anything, they weigh heavier on me now than they did back then, dragging me down, clawing at my insides. And when people say that what's buried in the past should stay there, they mean they don't want to have to deal with it. They're scared of the power of secrets to destroy lives but keeping secrets can destroy you from the inside. Believe me, I know. And even the best kept secrets have a habit of forcing their way to the surface. I also wanted to tell you a little bit about my new novel, One Moment. And it focuses on two central characters, Finn, who is a quirky 10 year old boy who's obsessed with gardening and particularly loves Alan Titchmarsh, who's idol and a 59 year old cafe worker called Kaz, who works in a cafe in Halifax and also looks after her younger brother, Terry, who has schizophrenia. Now the story starts just before they meet for the first time. And what neither of them know is that the second time they meet will be a moment which changes both of their lives forever. And it is a, I'm told, a heartbreaking, but ultimately uplifting story very much about the strength of human kindness and how two strangers can help each other through some really difficult times. So that may well be something that you'd like to read at the moment. I'd also like to recommend some more books um, for you because I know this is a time when we all have some more time on our hands than usual. Firstly, I want to recommend all the other books in the Read Regional 20 programme. If you have a look at the New Writing North website, you can find more details about all of these books, but there really is something for everyone. We have literary fiction, crime, uh, historical, true life, uh, we have poetry, we have children's novels, we have pretty much everything there that you could possibly want to read by brilliant authors, uh, all based and set in the north of England, so do please have a look. And three recommendations just from myself of books that I've really enjoyed and have helped to you know, really take my mind off things during the current uh, situation. The first is Three Hours by Rosamond Lupton, which is set, as the title implies, in uh, set over three hours during a siege in a school in southwest England. Now, although obviously it's a very serious subject matter, what Rosamond Lupton manages to do really cleverly is to, compile, is to put together an incredibly gripping thriller, which will leave you absolutely breathless at times. But to underpin it with incredible warmth and tenderness, we get the stories of teacher, head teacher, pupils and parents during this siege and the relationships between them and the love between them that gets them through this time is something which I think will stay with you for a long time afterwards. Another recommendation is Dear Edward by the uh, American author Anne Napolitano. And this centers on a plane crash in which 191 people are killed, but there is one survivor, Edward, whose own parents and older brother were amongst those who died in the plane crash. Again, it sounds incredibly um, sad and difficult subject matter, and on one level it is, but it is so much more than that because it follows Edward in the weeks, months and years following the plane crash to see how he manages to cope and come to terms with what's happened to him and with the support of uh, loved ones around him. And again, it's incredibly uplifting in, in terms of the, the spirit of human nature and human kindness. 
And thirdly is Leonard and Hungry Paul by the Irish author Ronan Hessian. This is published by Blue Moose Books, who are an independent publisher based near me in Hebden Bridge, West Yorkshire. And again, it's so important to be supporting our independent publishers at this time. Now, Leonard and Hungry Paul is a beautiful, tender, gentle story, which tells of Leonard and his friend Hungry Paul and all the little things in life, I think, which we don't appreciate, or perhaps we haven't appreciated until moments like this. And it shines a light on those you know, really nice, gentle, tender relationships, family relationships, be it board games, bird tables, all sorts of um, wonderful things. And it's guaranteed to put a smile on your face and add a little bit of warmth to your heart at this point. So I would definitely recommend those for uh, reading during this time. And I look forward to being back with you on the other side of this to continue the Read Regional 20 programme in libraries across the north of England.